The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. The skull lay on the desk, gleaming in the thin daylight. It was an old piece of bone, clean and dry. It looked human until held in one's hands and studied. The eye sockets were huge, almost as large as the empty sockets of a bird of prey. The strong, yellowish teeth had sharp edges. The front teeth were fangs, made for piercing flesh, spilling blood. Callum's songmaster remembered what the thing had looked like when alive, something between a hawk and a wolf, and what was left of the human the creature had once been. The man had been Gordon Smay, a friend, a comrade in battling evil. With the remnant of his mind, his decency, he had begged Callum to kill him. Callum had done it. Gordon had been a good man, with a wife and children. He had slain many monsters, but in the end he had become one of them. Callum had saved the skull as a reminder that the land of Kartikos could corrupt anyone. So begins Death of a Dark Lord by Laurel K. Hamilton. This episode on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. And hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Skixmatix. And we're here with episode 17 already. I'm, I, I love the little mini-sodes. It makes us feel like we're really, really prolific here. We are going to be talking about Death of a Dark Lord. This is part of the Ravenloft book series. I thought it would be kind of fun to just throw one in here. And Laurel K. Hamilton is SEO gold. Gold! <laughs> Let's first just uh, go ahead and start with a basic plot outline. For those of you who aren't familiar with Ravenloft, this was a D&D setting from the 90s, and then White Wolf had it for a while, and I don't know who the hell owns it now. I think it's mentioned in the new D&D 5e. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, the idea was it's this land that's like a demi-plane, so it kind of sort of exists, but it's not super big. And inside the, the world of Ravenloft... Uh, is kind of where all the scary stuff got put for D&D, and it was this place with different domains that were ruled by Dark Lords, and the Dark Lords had huge amounts of powers within their domain, but they could never leave, and they were often tortured themselves in some way, shape, or form, but they did have some amount of power. So this is Death of a Dark Lord, so that's, you know, if you didn't get what that meant, that's what this meant. Let's talk about Death of a Dark Lord in particular. Elaine is a young woman. She's part of a monster-hunting coterie in this fantasy world, and she begins to exhibit magical powers. But magic, much like in the Warhammer fantasy universe, is evil. Can she learn to harness her evil powers? What of her unrequited love for the austere widower Conrad? It's Jane Austen meets R.A. Salvatore with a dash of Mary Shelley. Not featured in this book, The Death of Any Dark Lords. And there you go. A trigger warnings? Uh, a real dash. Just a hint of incest? <laughs> just a... <laughs> <You're> phrasing. <laughs> just, just, a, when you're, just a hint of incest with walnut undertones. <laughs> Like, her twin brother gets jealous when he sees her look at a different guy, and, like, they share a couple of meaningful touches, but beyond that, sexism galore. I mean, this is kind of, sort of, I think, meant to be a Jane Austen-ish tale, so it's got all of that stuff. I believe Laurel K. Hamilton does have experience with writing incest, now that I think about it. I, she's done so many books that have sexual undertones, I wouldn't be and surprised. And overtones and midtones. Foregrounds, backgrounds, and midgrounds. She follows the rule of three. Sums. <laughs> okay, so this was my book. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the one who read it all the way through. So let's start with the good. Some things that I liked, it just, it was, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I thought it was a, a fun read. Like, it just, it went along quickly, and it moved fast, and it wasn't, I feel like this is a harsh way to say it, but it wasn't pretentious at all. Like, it wasn't trying to be something that it wasn't. That's true. It came across as fine, and, like, I wanted to read a quick, fun D&D book, and that's pretty much what I got. And so, I enjoyed that about it, and I knew that I would enjoy about it. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Also... There's a werewolf, uh, there's zombies, there's uh, betrayal, treachery, 
a creepy Undertaker. Like, I felt like I was reading a horror novel. And we've had a lot of non-horror novels here recently that we've done, and so that was really nice. Oh, if I'd known there was a creepy Undertaker and zombies and werewolves, I might have stuck it out further. Eh, uh, oh well. I thought it was uh, decently written and enjoyable. I, I gotta say, I tried reading... Is it Grave Offerings? Burnt Offerings? Whatever the first in the Anita Blake series is. And I really disliked it. Like, I liked what she was going for, but I hated so many of the characters that it was really difficult to uh, to give a damn about where the plot went. Um, and, like, there's this one vampire, and I was like, oh man, I cannot wait till she kills him. And I looked at a wiki entry to kind of see, like, where is this going? So, I, you know, sometimes knowing where things are going especially in a series, can help me get excited about it. Right. And I found out that that person that I hated so much becomes her love interest throughout the series, like her number one love interest. And I was like, oh. That is the uh, the theme throughout the series, is they introduce a new character, they become yet another of her love interests. <laughs> but I, he is terrible and annoying and, like, just a lot of bad stereotypes. But anyway... So I, I was a little worried that this would strike me in the same way. And I'll admit, I didn't like a good amount of the characters, but eventually a lot more characters are thrown in the mix, so we have quite a few to choose from. Let's talk about the bad. So, Skix, I know that you weren't super fond of what you read. What what can you put into words, and maybe I can uh, add some details onto that? Yeah, well, as I said, I didn't get far enough in to get, uh, you know, the, the monsters. and, and So really, I just sort of had... Uh, a, a few scenes with, with some of the main characters uh, assembling. For my taste, the writing style was light and fluffy and at odds with, which isn't bad in and of itself, and at odds with the, what I think anyway, was the attempted tone of, you know, like corpses hanging from trees and, you know, visions of death and setting yourself on fire and that sort of thing. And, and just, like, the, the light, frothy style was just clashing with the content, which made me not care about the content, um, hmm. at least as far as I got. Like, I can kind of get what you're saying, because it's, it's it, all the Ravenloft stuff it very much goes for a gothic feel, mm -hmm. right? It goes for, they go for the kind of classic monsters. They go for, you know, the Frankenstein, the Jekyll and Hyde, those sorts of classic monsters, and then they put them in 19th century clothing and package it up and call it a day, right? I mean, that's kind of, that's their part and parcel, but the writing does not feel gothic at all. Right. That, I mean, that's kind of, yeah, and I can get that, though I, I was all right with it, but I get why that can be a frustration. I'll, I'll give you some of <laughs> my issues, which was that the light and fluffy writing I enjoyed, then every now and then she would go so florid as to become purple. <laughs> Uh, like, this one I actually kind of enjoyed. Uh, Harkin, so here's here's a problem. Harkin, Lucas, and Conrad Byrne, Byrne I think, are, are two of the main characters. Well, Harkin's not that much of a main character. Harkin is our Dark Lord, but because both of their names have lots of K's and N's, and they're both very, like, austere and uh, set apart from everyone else, I kept getting them mixed up, so I was really surprised at the end when they enter into a pact with each other. <laughs> and it was like, oh wait, they're two different people or whatever. So Harkin is our Dark Lord, um, our titular Dark Lord. And here's, I actually kind of like this section. This is why I noted this. Harkin wanted to feast on pure flesh to crack the bones of saintly men and suck the marrow from them. There was nothing like fresh marrow to warm a wolf wear on a cold winter's day. <laughs> I can never take wolf wear seriously. It, it's an interesting concept, but when you name it, it suddenly becomes ridiculous. I don't even think like that is a D&D &D thing, is it? I mean, I don't know. He just shape changes into a wolf when he wants to. I... Well, theoretically, a wolf wear is a wolf that shape changes into a man. And maybe he is, but I never saw anything in here that what a <laughs> what a great backstory that would be, right? Like just this wolf wandering the demi plane of dread, and then suddenly the dark powers behind everything are like, "You wolf, you shall rule this land." And he's like, "Ah." <laughs> <laughs> I mean that I, I want that story right I want birth of a dark lord this is the for Kartikos yeah. this is the land of Kartikos 
some more prose that's even worse, I think. Um, so this is, like, crying in this book is, is <laughs> I, I don't know, like, it's it's either the best or worst thing that can happen to a person. It makes sex. Like, here's this, <laughs> here's, here's this, uh, this little quote. It was his fault, his doing. Jonathan would not let himself cry. He didn't deserve it. A scream cut the morning. A wordless wail that held all the pain in the world. I couldn't imagine reading that without like somebody with something in their hand that they were holding on to dearly, and then it just fell in slow motion to the ground. The shattering teacup uh, moment. A snow globe, perhaps. Rosebud. <laughs> also, similarly, someone else having a difficult time with crying. She did not cry as dry inside as a seashell left on a high shelf to gather dust and dream of lost paradises. Wow. <laughs> like, like in the middle of like, there was nothing like the bones of a saintly man to get <laughs> like this sort of stuff randomly. I, I'm imagining her going to a writing group once a week, and that's when those passages were written. <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it doesn't ruin the story, but I just had to comment on those. Then also, Nobody in this story is self-aware worth a damn, and that could be on purpose, but my favorite moment with that is this, where I guess it's Teresa, which is Jonathan, who leads the coterie of people. Jonathan is, is a mage hunter, and he basically hunts down witches and kills them, and then suddenly his adopted daughter turns out to be magic, and it's like, oh shit, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what most of the story is about, which you will notice does not include a Dark Lord. And there's this bit where essentially what happens is like they go out uh, on different adventures, really about one and a half adventure for the whole thing, but they are they keep going out for different reasons and doing different things, and uh, 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 Elaine, uh, the magic using girl, keeps using magic, and she has like a wizard there to help teach her, and every time it happens, Jonathan gets more upset, and it causes distance between them and this is one of the first times and he's like oh my god magic is evil and she huffs off all upset even though she knows that it's going to happen and Teresa, Jonathan's wife says remember this that it was not magic that drove them away but prejudice and I'm like no it's because she's a magic user <laughs> like <laughs> it also sounds like it's setting up a profound statement and, and then ends with the word prejudice which nitpicky writer shit here Prejudice, how it sounds to the ear, fucks up the pithiness of the statement. Was was hatred would would have fit, but prejudice is it's very kind of modern sounding. Hmm. There are definitely some modern sounding bits in here. At one point, they encounter a new group that comes into the realm of Kardakos, and they don't know where they are. And actually, they mentioned one of their gods, I think Burgot, a couple of times. And so I looked that up to see, like, oh, are they from Dragonlance or whatever? But I didn't get any matches from Googling it, so I think they're just from a, you know, another made-up world or right. whatever. And they all talk like they're straight out of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but our main characters uh, talk in, I, I would say, decently modern speak. I, you know, they're not... Like, you couldn't drop them in <laughs> on the streets of Detroit and they'd be fine, but, but essentially they're... They're, they're you good. couldn't drop anyone on the streets of Detroit and they'd be fine. Well, I guess it depends on how high you drop them from, right? <laughs> I mean, that's that's at least the first consideration. Yeah, yeah. No higher than the sixth floor. All right, so what do you say we go on to the ugly? Let's do it. Let's spoil the shit out of this puppy. Uh, the real mission that they go on that takes up most of the, second, the latter half of the book is these dead are coming back to life in this town and... Um, people don't know why and basically the like second they get into the town they are just started to be mowed down like they lose like three members of their party right away and it's like oh shit but cool thing because of the uh, people who've come in from the other land one of them is a cleric and and he's able to bring someone back from the dead now this shouldn't happen in Ravenloft and it's weird that he's able to do it. Assumedly, it's like he had one spell left over that he brought with him. But because clerics are unable to reach their gods from within the walls of Ravenloft, he then isn't able to 
repeat the process, but Elaine is able to learn from him super quickly, and she starts healing people left and right, and it's the best healing they've ever seen, and it's like, OMG, this is awesome. And I honestly thought, with the way that they were doing it, that this was going to lead to Elaine becoming the new Dark Lord. That's not the way it goes down. Here's the thing. You know that little section at the beginning that we heard, the first few paragraphs? You might notice that it's all about Calum's Songmaster. You might notice that I haven't mentioned Calum at all in here. It's because the first chapter, which is so interesting and really got me excited about the book, that plot doesn't play out until literally the last three chapters of the book. And so it's like, why was this even introduced? I really feel like Laurel wrote this book that was essentially a Jane Austen with prejudice against magic users. And, you know, the editors were like, okay, this is good, but we either have a supplement coming out or maybe we're going to give some stats on some of the Dark Lords. And so can you put the Dark Lord in there? And can you do something with that? And we want the title Death of a Dark Lord. And she was like, um... Uh, sure? And then, like, went home and drank a lot and was like, oh my god, what am I gonna do? Because Calum was a member of this group, and he might have even used to lead it or whatever, but now he's old, and he's basically dying, and Harkin is like, hey, I can put you in a younger body, I found a way to do it. And Harkin wants to switch himself with Conrad, because Conrad is a Vishtani which are all the time called the G word in here, which is supposedly bad. And you don't know what the hell I'm talking about. G-Y-P-S-Y. -Y. Uh, so, but, you know, um, uh, in, <laughs> in the intervening years, that's kind of come to be known as a uh, uh, racially negative epithet. But they're not Romani because there's no Romania, but they're called the Vashanti. Uh, Romani aren't from Romania. They have no relationship to Romania. Really? Really. <laughs> I assume that's what it is. Nope. Okay, well, well, they aren't Romanian either. They... <laughs> <laughs> no, they're probably... Uh, uh, Romani uh, originated in India, actually, and, and I'm sure there was no India either. Got it. Or in okay. Egypt, which is the origin of the Gisler. Okay, carry on. <laughs> Sorry. All right, no, that's interesting. So we're learning about language here mm -hmm. on Dread Dialectic. Okay, so in Ravenloft, the Vishanti are the only people who can pass between worlds. You know, that's one of the things with the Dark Lords, they are trapped in their own domain, and so he's like, I'm gonna switch bodies with Guy, but I wanna test out that this magic works first. So he goes to Calum and is like, hey, you wanna switch into a young guy? And Calum's like, no, I'm good, but oh my god, the pain. And that's chapter one. Chapter 30, <laughs> we come back to that plot. Oh, wow. In the meantime, it's revealed, that, like in Chapter 30, that apparently Harkin was like, well, I want to take Conrad over, but I want to kind of fuck with him first. And so he, he sets up this town where the zombies are at, and he's going to engineer it so that everyone in Conrad's party except Conrad dies. And he gets to watch him watch everything that he loves dies and have some fun with him before he takes over his body. But it's like, this is the body that you want to inhabit. And you're going to put it in like mortal peril with no real safeguards for this whole time and just hope that everyone around him dies? Like, it's this really nonsensical plan, which is why... I honestly think that this whole Dark Lord plot was shoehorned in at the last moment. He pretty much gets his wish, though. I, I think a few people survive, but not many survive. But I really liked the end of this book, because at the end, just everything that can go wrong does. Like, Elaine's twin brother, who she loves, 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 dies. And so she's like, no, but now I know how to bring him back. And she she brings back the, the cleric's daughter who came back but all she has to fill her up with is pain so this young elf girl comes back just screaming non-stop so that they have to just stab her until she <laughs> can't scream anymore then we find out that all the magic she healed people with has this dark undertone to it and like things are growing out of them and they're all hacking each other to get rid of it until they just bleed to death and you know it just becomes this blood soaked gore infested 
ending where everybody is dying, and it was like, all right, this is fun that you followed through on that. And then, like, literally at the end, we find out that Callum did take the guy up on his offer. Um, a young person gets into his body, and he takes pity on him because he's in his body, so they suffocate him to death really quickly. And then he goes off to live his life as a bard again, but then Harkin gets into Conrad's body, and... He's like, shit, now I'm just me because he's so powerful in this world that the body essentially just changes into him. And he's like, I still can't travel through worlds. So he goes and kills Callum out of spite. And it just, it was like, there's no need for that. But it, it felt like, all right, good. Like, Laurel really followed through on this being a horror novel. You know, it was just like, uh, and then everybody dies horribly. And the only person who lives... Uh, Elaine might have. I can't remember, actually. I think Elaine might have lived knowing that all of her magic was tainted and corrupted. But for sure who lived was the Dark Lord. The, the one who dies in the title. Yes. <laughs> like I say, I, I enjoyed it, uh, for sure. I really enjoyed just so much about it. But the, the Dark Lord plot felt completely and totally unnecessary, unwarranted in the last minute. And... It was kind of comical in places where I don't think it wanted to be comical. As long as you had fun along the way, and it sounds like you did. Definitely. I'm kind of curious, now that you know about it, does it sound like something you're curious to read, or are you like, no, that's enough for me? I'm kind of on the fence, really. I would probably read it if I didn't already have sort of a reading list for the rest of the series. <laughs> uh, for me, I, I don't know. I guess I would say... You know, start with Vampire of the Mist, which is the first one by Christy Golden. Uh, it's been years since I read it, but I remember enjoying it. And then finding out years later when doing um, my Realms read-through, finding out that that character was active in the short stories beforehand was fun. And, like, if you like that one, then for sure read through all of them. As far as I know, most of them aren't in any order, but there are a few that are in order, and so... You know, why not? It's I, I think there were only maybe 15 or so total uh, that were put out. And, and, and you know, they're available on Kindle now and everything. So, you know, it, it, try the first one, and if you dig it, keep going. And obviously, if you're a Laurel K. Hamilton fan, I'm guessing you will enjoy it. I'm, I'm assuming that her writing style has changed over the years, but I'm, I'm betting you'll find some stuff in there that you're like, oh, that's kind of, you know, like that's what she used that as a template for such and such or right. whatever. Fewer dicks, though, I think. Usually just no dicks. I wonder if that's what it was. If they were like, Laurel, could you cut out the 30-page incest scene that's really graphic and put in a dark one? <laughs> and she was like, well, <sighs> shocks. Who knows? Uh, in any case, uh, do, uh, you know, let us know. Do you agree, disagree? or something completely different, write us at dread.dialectic at gmail.com. Also write us if you have any suggestions for things that we should read uh, later on down the road. Uh, take, uh, you know, Especially if you've written something and you really think it would do well uh, on, on the show. Um, novels, novellas, and a one specific short story, because we are trying to do short story episodes uh, here on out. Um, in fact, next episode will be a short story. Another No Sleep that a friend of mine recommended to me. Uh, the same friend who recommended The Whistlers. This one's called New Fish. All right. Also, uh, on, on any of the formats you may be listening to us, uh, many of them have uh, comment sections, and you can uh, reply to us there as well. Absolutely. We live for the comments. We are sad, lonely men living on mountains at different parts of the world. Mine's a mesa. Uh, we would love to hear any comments that you might have, but that's probably the best I, place I'll bet you it. anything our first comment will be, kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, our first comment's going to be, hey, I love your stuff. Check out this link, blah, 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 blah. I'm not spam. Anyway, until next time, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Gix Maddox. And we are 